Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Joe Davich. I'm the executive director here at the Georgia Center for the Book. And on behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book and the DeKalb Library Foundation, welcome to another uh, continuing series of online events that we began in late March due to the global pandemic. We do have some exciting events coming up for you in December, and we try to keep our schedule a little bit light. So if you would like to find out about those events, of course, you can check out our website, georgiacenterforthebook.org, follow us on Facebook, or you can follow us on Instagram as well. We will present on December 3rd, another in our series of events of the On My Mind reading series with the South Carolina Center for the Book. And I'm sure you won't wanna miss that. We also have a special event coming up on December 11th, where we will once again show the film, Lillian Smith, Breaking the Silence. And following that live stream, we will feature a panel of four guests, including Matthew Touch from the Lillian Smith Center, Sue Ellen Lovejoy, who is a relative of Lillian Smith's, Anna Weinstein, who is currently working on a project involving Lillian Smith, and a few others. So you can find out about those events on Facebook and get tickets through Eventbrite. Right now, of course, we like to talk about money. It is the time of the year that we're spending maybe a little more than we should. Maybe we're budgeting a little better than we should be. And maybe we're trying to stretch those dollars out as far as they possibly can. It's very interesting with this book that we're going to talk about tonight because we find out that money really may not be what we actually think it is, or it's actually changed from what it started out in the first place. Our guest this evening, Frederick Kaufman, is an English professor by training and by trade. He's written the books, Bet the Farm, How Food Stopped Being Food, and A Short History of the American Stomach. But for the past 10 years, he's really focused on the fiction that is money, which has led to him writing many articles for publications such as Wired, Foreign Policy, and Bloomsburg. And he has also lectured widely in the United States and Europe, including lectures in front of the General Assembly of the United Nations. Tonight, of course, that book is The Money Plot, A History of Currency's Power to Enchant, Control, and Manipulate. We hope that you will find it as fascinating as those of us who've already read the book, and we hope that you will join us in purchasing a copy from our local bookstore this evening. But right now, I would like to turn this evening's program over to Frederick Kaufman. Frederick? Hi, Joe. Thank you very much. It's a really nice introduction. Um, there is really so much to say about money, and uh, we all have our opinions about money, obviously. But I have uh, some slides. Uh, that I'd like to share with you tonight and uh, just to maybe uh, show a different side of money. I think most people have a very strong sense that uh, money is something that we use for exchange. And that is certainly the case, but that was not always the case. And with that, I'm gonna start my, my, my screen share here. And um, I am going to go to my slideshow. And um, the person who really gave us this idea that money uh, was really used for exchange was Adam Smith, who in 1776 published The Wealth of Nations. And he came up with his own money plot. He came up with a, a very interesting idea uh, that we all, for some reason, believe. And that is that money began with barter, that uh, the first money systems were, as we can see here, you. We're trading some fish for grain or our carrots for a comb. And uh, everybody seems to believe that such is the case. And for many years, since 1776, people believed it was the case really for almost a hundred years. Uh, and then something happened, which is that the uh, ethnographers and anthropologists of the 19th century and early 20th century went out in search of the quote unquote primitive cultures that would show us and prove that barter came before money and um, they never found such a thing. And generally speaking, nobody believes that that is actually the case, that money did not come from barter, that Adam Smith in this moment of, uh, of England in the late 18th century, a nation of shopkeepers, that it was clear to him that it was all exchange, but such is not the case. And uh, this was proven roundly. So what is money then? What is money and where did it come from? 
Um, this is uh, a part of the hinterlands of Kenya. And imagine that it's not a, uh, a luxury resort <laughs> like we're looking at today, but in fact, that those were the huts and the areas of people who lived about 65,000 years ago uh, near the coast. And uh, life was good. I mean, uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't mind it. And, and clearly, uh, they had in their own way uh, an advanced culture. Um, and when ethnologists and anthropologists and archaeologists started digging up the remains of this very ancient culture, um, they found beads. And the, each, each one of these beads, and these are the actual beads, some of them that they found, they're about half the circumference of a penny. And many of them had very strange and intricate markings on them. And it was clear that these ancient people uh, from Kenya uh, were not only using these beads for ornamentation, but that there is some sort of symbol system involved in these beads. And so we, uh, they put them through a lot of tests. They tried to figure out where these beads came from and what they were. And they discovered that they were actually made of a substance called calcium carbonate. And this is uh, only interesting uh, to the extent that um, it was the exact same substance <laughs> as the eggs of the ancient black necked African ostrich <laughs> pictured here, uh, clearly an artist's rendition of the ostrich. So um, somehow, these little beads had come from ostrich eggs, these little beads that were being used for some sort of strange purpose. And a lot of people started wondering, you know, wasn't ostrich leather more important than the egg? And how about ostrich feathers or even ostrich meat? Why were they so interested in the ostrich egg shells? Uh, this problem, this question was solved not too long afterwards when they discovered more full examples of the ostrich eggs. And I eat, they're huge. These are the largest eggs of any animal on earth. And they were being used, it's clear now, as containers. Um, money is a container too. If you think about money, it can contain anything. Money is, uh, everything on earth has its price. And so, and money can change from one thing to another almost magically, not only from one kind of money to another kind of money, but for any object on earth. Everything on earth, they say, has its price. Well, these are very primitive containers, clearly, but they could hold a lot. Each one could hold about a quart and a half of liquid. And it is clear that this was an ancient security system, just like money is a modern security system. It gives us security going forward in the future. In ancient Kenya, you could keep your fresh water in one of these quart and a half bowls. You could keep your nuts. You could keep your berries. You could keep whatever it was that was going to keep you alive. It could give you security. And it could also make it clear that there could be a plot going forward for you into the future. In other words, that this actually created a storyline for you going forward. So there's the question then, how did that egg, that container, which could hold something that could give you security for the future, how did that turn into a universal equivalent for all security? How was it that this idea of this, of this egg smashed could turn into an emblem of security or a metaphor of security? Um, and this idea started to fascinate 19th and early 20th century anthropologists and, uh, and ethnographers who tried to understand what was now clear to them was some of the earliest money, that which you could wrap around your neck, wrap around your arms. It would somehow indicate some sort of emblem of security for the future. It would give you status among others. And clearly there was some sort of magical incantation that would allow the egg to turn into the bead. Uh, chief among these ethnographers was this fellow named Bronislaw Malinowski, who's one of these really famous guys 
in the history of money systems. Uh, he was from Austria and around World War I, in the middle of World War I, he left uh, because he really wanted to understand what was going on and what he called, you know, what he perceived to be the primitive parts of the world and to understand what the, the primitive money systems were. And uh, in a very famous book that he published in 1922, uh, he spent a lot of time writing about his time with the, uh, what he called the Argonauts of the Western Pacific. He, uh, he went to the Trobriand Islanders in the islands of New Guinea uh, and the group called themselves Boyoas. And here they are, of course, there is Mr. Malinowski in the middle of them. And you can see he actually has some sort of beads or emblems of security and good luck on his arm. And the men to his right and, their, and his left are also having containers. And, uh, and the one on the far right has, uh, has an armband. Um, and he studied these people. He lived among them and worked among them. And he tried to figure out their system, their economic system. Um, what it was that they traded and exchanged. And he was told over and over again that he was going to witness what they called the magic of Kula. And that Kula was going to bring them, uh, was going to bring great um, wealth to everybody. And so he watched the Trobriand Islanders as they made these huge canoes and they cast these magic spells. And then they set out into the ocean. And eventually he was able to come up with this, the famous map uh, of the quote unquote Kula ring, uh, the Kula ring. And you can see uh, in the lower left corner, there is uh, in, in New Guinea, right? That the Trobriand Islanders would leave and start going to certain islands and then to other islands and then back and then back and forth. And it, a full Kula ring could take about 10 years. It was epic and it was dangerous. And yet this was what would bring prosperity to the, uh, to the Trobriand Islanders. And so um, what was going on as these Islanders made this ring? Well, what they, what they started off was with uh, white shell armbands. And then they would go to another island and they trade those white shell armbands for red shell armbands. And then they go to another island and trade those red shell armbands for a white shell necklace. And you get the picture, they would then trade the necklace for another red shell necklace. And eventually they would come home basically with the same shells that they started out with. And um, this led uh, Malinowski to ask the question, why would men risk life and limb to travel across huge expanses of dangerous ocean to give away what appear to be worthless trinkets? What were these shells what were these shells that gave the magic of plenty? And what's so ironic is that what Malinowski was witnessing was what is now known as primitive money. He was, he was witnessing people exchanging, not haggling, not bartering, not buying, not selling, but exchanging different kinds of shells that then of course would be, would increase one's status, would show that you had conquered many odds on your, on your way through the future and um, that you had secured your way through danger, much like money does for us. Money secures our way for, uh, through danger. It, uh, it gives us confidence in the future and it gives us status. And in fact, these shells were known as cowries and they were the world's first reserve currency, the world's first reserve currency. And in fact, they were known everywhere uh, on earth from not just New Guinea and Micronesia, but to Africa and really to the, uh, to the west and east coast of the Americas in the ancient world, this currency in shells. Um, and they, they not only were they used as status and as security, but they could also tell stories quite literally in the sense that the wampum of the, uh, of the famed wampum of North America, these were used to commemorate treaties and to tell stories and history so that the money itself was a form of relating history and ideas of futurity. And this generally was worn along your body as we can see in the lower right here, this image of a person 
being covered with shells and that somehow the, the contiguity or the fact that the shells are close to your body gives you, again, the status, the security, and the way forwards into, into, the, into the future. Um, the idea then was that shells were the great reserve currency of those who lived near coastal regions and lived a fairly, what we would consider a fairly simple life, right? Uh, playing the shell game. And then something happened around 10,000 years ago. Um, and you saw the rise of great inland empires. And these inland empires were made possible by a new kind of money. Uh, and although we no longer use shells for money, we still can use uh, grain for money. I should point out, however, that shells, even, even about in 1896 in, uh, in Togoland, um, about uh, 20,000 cowries, cowrie shells could be exchanged for a German mark. So it really wasn't that long ago that, that the shells went out of business. But grain, as we know, is the bedrock of the derivatives industry in, uh, in, in modern finance. Grain futures, grain options, uh, this is the basis of the futures market. And domesticated grain begins about 10,000 years ago in ancient Sumer. And the fact that you are, I mean, think about it. Think about being an ancient uh, hunter-gatherer. You're walking along, you're looking for your berries, you're looking for your water, and all of a sudden you stop and you see a farm. And this person is staying put. He is programming his existence for the future with his own domesticated crops, his domesticated animals, and most likely a bevy of wives. So grain then becomes the next big revolution in money after, coin, after, uh, after shells. And of course, making grain is not possible, making is not possible without domesticating animals. And the domestication of animals, along with the domestication of grain, happens also about 10,000 years ago. And of course, livestock also becomes money. And in fact, even today in Vietnam, some parts of Vietnam, people can pay their taxes in, in livestock. And what's interesting here is the harness, the idea that the wild animal harnessed becomes a form of money, just like the domesticated crop, right? The, the, the undomesticated plant harnessed towards the future becomes money. Once the animal is domesticated, again, its story, its plot is, can now be set from the day of its birth to its death. It can be made to move through the harness back and forth. It can be made to plow and its fate is very clear. Women, the females of the species can quite literally bear interest. The males can be chosen, right? Either to increase and multiply or to be castrated or to be used for meat. And that is why the words cattle, chattel and capital are very closely related etymologically. The greatest king of the ancient times of ancient Sumer, Sumer was, was this fellow Ashurbanipal. And we can see him here, we can see him here on another domesticated beast on the, uh, on the horse, and there he is with that long beard. And then we can see him um, with these very little people coming to him. Um, and we can also see writing. And the first writing appears with the domestication of plants and animals and writing appears at the same time. So there's something about the use of grain as ancient money, the use of livestock as ancient money and the birth of writing. And this writing, I call it a Sumerian buzzfeed and I'll tell you why in a moment, is called cuneiform. And on the left, you can see that they were kind of really, really odd little pictograms pushed into wet clay. And a lot of people think that in proto-cuneiform, before there was cuneiform, before this first writing system was developed, that for instance, if the king had a, you, you, you want to do a horse, for instance, you would have a little statue of a horse. And if the king had a thousand horses, you'd have to have a thousand little statuettes. Because of course, 
they were rich because they had, they did not have to work because they had domesticated grain. They had more than enough food, right? But what happened is that somebody realized instead of making all these little miniature statues, you could press them, you could press them into clay. And all of a sudden, the world went from three dimensions into two. And the first writing was born. And in the center, we can see an ancient cuneiform tablet. And if you look carefully kind of down the middle, maybe you can see my cursor here, right down the middle, the, the form, the first form in every line is the same. The first line in every form is the same. And this was noted by the Bishop of Zealand, a guy named uh, Bishop Munter. And he theorized that it meant uh, king. And um, at that point, the great philologists of, uh, of Germany and other places started madly translating, thinking they were going to get all sorts of stories about the king and all sorts of epics. In fact, what they found was that simply it was a list, that the first writing was accounting. The first writing was all about the money. The first writing, all it was, was lists of the king's possessions, the lists of how many goats he had, how many cows he had. The great king Ashurbanipal has this much grain. And I mean, literally hundreds of thousands of cuneiform tablets. Ashurbanipal has this. Ashurbanipal has that. And of course, Ashurbanipal also had this, concubines. So it is clear that women, and it's not only clear, but rather unsettling, that women and women's bodies were also considered part of ancient wealth, that there was a trade in women, that there was a trade in concubines. And here we can, of course, if you look closely, you can see that they actually are covered contiguous to their body with shells and with necklaces, indicating some sort of ancient price. And this whole idea of marriage then uh, becomes a little bit transfigured by these ideas. Because of course, marriage is an early form of exchange. It's an early form of increasing and multiplying, creating security for the future through wives. And we can see this today uh, in all sorts of rituals that remain, uh, such as this contemporary wedding photograph uh, from Malaysia, a wedding photograph in, in which uh, the, the groom is actually harnessing the bride uh, with, with a particular kind of, of necklace, much the way ancient livestock was harnessed. Uh, and at this moment, this woman becomes a bride, and then from bride becomes wife, from wife becomes mother. So in other words, her path, her story is now defined and harnessed in much the same way as the ancients made money. And uh, we can see this uh, in modern times with this whole notion of the, the trophy wife that became very popular in the 1980s where, where the, the hedge fund magnates and the, uh, the junk bond kings felt that of course what they needed to go as the greatest signifier of their wealth would be a, would be a wife by their, by their side. Uh, this is a very male idea of money and a very violent uh, and almost transgressive idea of, of money. Um, because about around 500 BC, a new kind of money shows up to compete with grain. Um, and this, is, uh, this happens in the, in the ancient Peloponnese uh, in, in Greece, and this idea of the heavy metal god, and that there were these gods who actually uh, were the gods of the underworld, where there is the greatest riches uh, in the underworld. And these gods in, in the myths, they were all, they had been great gods, but that they had been, been, been torn apart and they're scattered underground. And these images here show Pluto. Uh, Pluto in one of his, in one of the more famous and uh, really uh, infamous his moments, which is his rape of Persephone who becomes queen of the underworld. And of course, what we're seeing here is the god of mining, the god of gold and silver and copper and tin and wealth beneath the earth, taking 
the goddess of grain and bringing her down underneath the ground to be his queen in an, in an extreme act of violence, which would of course then be leveraged later into spring. He gets, you know, he makes a deal with Persephone's mother, Demeter. Oh, Persephone can come up in the springtime and then you can have your grain again. But for the rest of the year, she's going to be with me uh, down below ground. Uh, what happens then is that money itself transforms into a different, and, and, it, and the first money comes, as we can see in the lower left, from uh, a, par, a part of what is now uh, Turkey's Aegean coast, which used to be called Lydia. Uh, that's where Troy is, as you can see uh, right, up, right up here. And in this river, I'm sorry, in this, in this ancient Lydia, there was a river called the, the Pactolus River. And it is said that the great king Midas, he of the, he of the Midas touch, the golden touch, uh, finally washed the golden touch off his hands in this river. And of course, Midas is a tragic story. And Persephone is a tragic story. And precious metal coinage begins at the same time the tragedy begins in ancient Greece. So we have these tragic myths of metal that are occurring at the exact same time as the first tragedies. And in these first tragedies, many of these heroes are like the heavy metal gods ripped to pieces. This river, this river is full of precious metal it's called electrum, which is a strange mixture of gold and silver together. And it was out of this material that we see the first precious metal coin. And there it is, there it is, the first precious metal coin made of electrum. And it is generally uh, assigned to a great king whose name was Aliates. And his son, of course, was Croesus. And of course, we have the expression uh, rich as Croesus because Croesus had more of these coins than anyone on earth. Um, of course, he had them until Cyrus, uh, the Assyrian, came up and um, roasted uh, Croesus and took all of his coins and melted them down and minted them again. And uh, then the Persians had them, of course, until Alexander the Great came and melted them all down and put his name on them. And so coinage itself is tragic because you have these epic heroes, uh, which are then subsequently melted down and they just go into somebody else. And it became very popular in Rome, of course. Rome was full of um, ancient coins and they would commemorate not just gods, uh, but individuals. And so it was a real form of political propaganda in ancient Rome. And I'd like to dwell a little bit on ancient Rome for a while because money in ancient Rome in many ways is, is, is very familiar uh, to what it is today. Um, <laughs> yes, of course, is Elizabeth Taylor and, uh, and Richard Burton playing Antony and Cleopatra. Um, the problem with coinage begins with, uh, with their affair, uh, really, uh, when in 32 BC, uh, the Roman triumvirate declares war on, on Cleopatra. And of course, Mark Antony goes to her lover and they have a great civil war in Rome, which uh, ultimately they lose, of course, and uh, Antony and Cleopatra uh, both commit suicide. And guess who gets all the gold? Rome gets all the gold of Cleopatra, all the great Egyptian gold. And this makes Rome rich. And it is one of the great, and they, they, they are, it's the great society. They have orgies and they build aqueducts. But of course, as anybody familiar with economics knows, after the boom comes the bust. And uh, within, within one generation, Rome is, uh, is completely broke and uh, on the verge of civil war as the proletariat cannot eat and they are threatening to burn down uh, the senator's palaces. Uh, at which point the, uh, the great senators went to Tiberius who was hanging out at one of his uh, many palaces in Capri, nice little palace. Tiberius was generally perceived to be a, a rather dour and unhappy emperor as we can see uh, from this image of him, from this, uh, and he basically said, get Sextus Marius. 
And Sextus Marius was a mining magnate in Spain. And so uh, the Romans did get Sextus Marius and uh, they brought him to the Tarpian Rock, which we can see on the left. And they marched him to the end of the Tarpian Rock as we can see in the middle and then ceremoniously flung him off the Tarpian Rock to his death, at which point uh, Tiberius got all of the money and all of the ancient gold and silver of poor Sextus Marius and uh, the problem was solved. That in a nutshell is the problem with coinage, which is that it is dependent upon, upon metal. And uh, for a long time after that, there were real issues. How could we get enough money to uh, manage the growth of humanity and the growth of cities and city states? And this really came to a head in, in the medieval period. And uh, it was solved by this rather dour gentleman all the way on the left. Uh, he is named uh, Pope Innocent IV. And in the year 1250 at one of the Lateran councils, he proclaimed that, um, that the church was actually a corporate body, that the, the church itself, the ancient, the medieval Catholic church was one gigantic body. And thus we had the birth of corporate personhood. Uh, this was an extraordinary revolution, an extraordinary revolution in the history of money. It was the idea of the corporation and the idea of like the, the, uh, the Medici's, uh, you know, in their corporation and their ability to uh, leverage their wealth, not only from precious metals, but into a credit economy. And it was in this period of time that we have the beginnings of modern finance, that we have mortgages, that we have, um, that, that we have uh, real estate being leased and that is the theme in finance. A new kind of financial accounting takes place. It's no longer like it was for Ashurbanipal, just a list of everything Ashurbanipal owns. But the idea that if I loan you money, I will be able to get it back and more. And this was the great debate of the entire medieval period, how money could grow. And the church the general feelings that in, in history was that the church was very much against this, usury, charging people's interest. But in fact, now it became clear really in the past 30 or 40 years that the church was really the greatest business of all in the Middle Ages. That the, the most uh, lucrative branch of the Medici's was the one right near the Vatican. And this idea of counting backwards from the end of the mortgage to the beginning became a very common form of accounting. Now we always think of money backwards. Uh, when we think about our 401ks, when we think about our retirement savings, when we think about what we're putting in, we're always thinking from the end towards the present. And that was the great gift of the church to finance, is thinking from the end of it towards the beginning, seeing time as a set period, demarcating it, and understanding how money could grow through time so that we could begin to create modern finance. Um, that still did not stop the general mercantilist trend towards understanding that the more gold they had, the more credit and the more credit finance they could create. And what you, of course, the apex of this is the, the great conquistadors and, um, and, and, and uh, conquestors and, and mercantile conquestors of the, uh, of the late Middle Ages and the early modern period. There's Columbus on the left, there's Cortez in the middle asking Montezuma, where's the gold? And there's Pizarro on the bottom right, taking the king of the Incas prison, uh, prisoner and asking for a ransom in gold. Um, and all of this frenzy over gold is ultimately what, um, what led to the great bankruptcies of great empires of Spain and of Italy uh, at the end of the Middle Ages. Uh, gold certainly was not the answer, and it certainly was not the answer to those who came to America. Uh, we, have, um, we have Jamestown at the top, and we have Plymouth Rock at the bottom, and the Americans from the start uh, forgot something. They didn't bring enough money, and so they had to start 
right from the beginning, figuring out what they were going to do about that. And so they just made their own. Uh, what we're seeing here is in South Carolina, a, a $60 bill. Um, and uh, in Philadelphia at the bottom is there's a one third of a dollar bill. They just started printing their money much to the chagrin of the British. And also it was very difficult during the colonial period to take money from one state to another. The exchange rates were, were, were almost impossible to control. Uh, it was a real problem. It was a real problem among the states and it was a real problem with England. And it was solved of course uh, by that gentleman, Alexander Hamilton, who, um, who very cleverly uh, created the dollar. Uh, and that was the first coinage act of 1792 when the dollar uh, came into being. And it was one of the intelligent, smartest things he did was he made the dollar ambiguous. Uh, it could be defined as either gold or silver. It was half credit and half debt. A lot of it was based on taxes. A lot of it was based on tariffs. It was a very complicated story with a lot of ambiguity. And really from 1792 for the next hundred years to 1892, there was a struggle. The dollar struggled through boom and bust to finally emancipate itself from the metal that was holding it captive. And we can see here most famously the speech uh, of William Jennings Bryan at the Democratic National Convention in 1896. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. He was uh, trying to get money back onto a silver standard to satisfy the populism of the farmers in America who were then going broke because money was on a gold standard. And this did not cease. The uprisings did not cease and the, uh, the problems with the currency did not cease until Christmas Eve 1913 when Woodrow Wilson signed the Federal Reserve Act uh, locking up gold for good in the Federal Reserve. And uh, you can see there it is quite literally held captive by the dollar. So the great irony here is that gold, which used to be the, the ultimate money had been overtaken by the dollar. And the final act occurred on Friday the 13th uh, in August of 1971, when uh, Nixon right in the middle realized with his uh, Secretary of the Treasury, John Conley, who's sitting to Nixon's right, just left of him, who had been the governor of Texas, that uh, they did not need any gold at all. The dollar did not need to be attached to gold anymore. And so on the evening uh, of Sunday, the 15th of August, 1971, Nixon famously floated the dollar. And uh, the dollar is now a story. The dollar has no relationship to metal or to grain or to anything. It's a story that's called full faith and credit of the United States. Uh, and the fact that the dollar um, was floated led to uh, some of the greatest increases in capital in human history, but it also led to this very strong sense that money was nothing. Money was just a metaphor. It was a story people believed. And as long as they believed it, it was worth something, which of course eventually opened the door uh, for Bitcoin, which also like all primitive money uh, is a form of security, is a form of gambling, it's a form of uh, status, but it's also a way of encrypting a story towards the future. What we're looking at here is Craig Wright, uh, who says that under the pseudonym of Satoshi Nakamoto uh, created the Bitcoin, uh, which are also known as Satoshis. And underneath you can see the original uh, encrypted word, much like the words of Ashurbanipal of that first Bitcoin, uh, the Genesis block that was delivered in 2009. The last block of Bitcoin will be uh, delivered in 2140. So if you, by looking through the history of money, you can see that all through it has been about story, status, security, speculation, and crypto really is nothing new, nothing new. And that in short 
is the money plot. And uh, I'm going to stop my share now. And uh, I guess I've gone 40 minutes or so and open this up uh, back to Joe and for questions, if anybody has any. Excellent. Thank you so much, Fred. Um, that was a great, great presentation. And if anyone does have any questions, don't forget to go ahead and use the Q&A feature on the app. Um, if you have an iPad, it's right up at the top. It says Q&A and feel free to type those questions in and we'll read them out loud to share them with everyone. Um, you know what I found really fascinating um, as I was as reading the book and, and making my little notes is you, know, you are an English professor. And um, I love the fact that the book was peppered with references you know, to the, uh, the Fairy Queen, the Romance of the Rose, the Scarlet Letter, Frank Herbert's Dune. Um, and it just makes me wonder that when you write a book like this, you, know, you seem to have a completely different view and perspective than an economist would. And you know, it, it's very digestible. There's like not a lot of economic jargon, you know, did it give you a different perspective on money than say someone who's trained to simply think of money in certain ways and factors if they've gone to an economic school or a business school, something like that? Well, there, there are really two factors here. Um, the first is that it's, it's widely accepted among economists that money is a fiction. Like no, nobody, nobody will, will doubt that. And uh, really, for the, really for the past, 200 years or so, all economists understand that it's a symbol, that it's a sign, that it's a metaphor, that it is a fiction, right? That there's money of account, that um, you know, the idea of imaginary money, that, that, that's, a, that's a phrase that's been around for about 200 years. And so really I, the only leap I made is that if money is a fiction, which it is, then it should act like one. And as an English professor, I, I know about a lot about how, how fictions act. The second part of the question is this notion of how economists think and how other people think. The other thing that really drove me to write this book was a very strong sense I had that a lot of people out there will say, I, I don't know, I don't understand money. I don't, I, you know, th they'll take themselves out of the conversation. And so what I really wanted to do was empower a lot of people to really understand money in a different way, in a different way, in, in a way that, that it, let's say a humanities uh, person could somebody who loves novels, somebody who loves history, to really grasp this fiction in a way that would empower them and allow them not only to be the victims of the money culture, but to also be able to write more of the story, to be enabled to realize that if it is a fiction, right, that it'll act like fiction, but that also we can help write that fiction and push that fiction in the direction we want it to go as opposed to just this kind of culture of victimhood with money. It's kind of, Joe, what you were saying at the beginning. It's Christmas season, there's not enough money. Why is that? Money in its essentially was to give us security, was to ensure our future. That's the essence of it. It's only in a very late stages that it's been transformed into this thing that we don't have enough of. Hmm. Interesting, thank you so much. So we do have a question from Dennis, and Dennis asks, what do you think of FDR's executive order that made gold illegal to own starting in the 1930s? Yeah, that's a, that's a well, that's, a, that's exactly what I'm talking about, uh, which is that FDR, and I, and I spend a lot of time in the book comparing Hoover to FDR, and why Hoover failed to uh, affect the Great Depression whereas FDR did not. And Hoover, of course, was an orphan. He was born impoverished. He was brilliant. He went to Stanford. He became a geologist. And he made $100 million in zinc mines in Asia. So he, as an, he was an engineer. He saw very clearly that money was worth its weight in gold, that money had a mathematical equivalent and that that mathematical equivalency and those geological equivalencies meant money. FDR, of course, was not bothered by such things. He was born rich. He realized, hey, we got a problem. We're gonna make money what we wanna make money. And the first thing we gotta do is lock up gold because gold is cramping, is cramping my style. 
So of, of course, uh, of course. And, and that was what allowed ultimately the, uh, after World War II, the fact that he was locking up the gold when we had World War II, all the European nations to be safe brought their gold over to the United States. And so by the end of World War II, we had more gold than any nation ever in the history of the world locked up in the basement of the Federal Reserve. And it was on the strength of all that gold that uh, the, the famous Bretton Woods Agreement came about in 1944, which made the dollar the world's reserve currency, which it remains to this day, although there are signs. And, and now Nixon, though, in 71, it didn't really undo the Bretton Woods. It just, it, it took us off the gold standard, correct? Uh, yes. Um, you know, uh, John Connolly uh, famously said that to, to everybody, to all the other uh, treasury secretaries of the world, um, the dollar is, dollar is your problem, not ours. Dollar is your problem. We just floated it do what you like. They couldn't do anything. They, could, they couldn't do anything about it. And it was a unilateral, it was a unilateral act on the part of the Nixon administration, really out of a sense of, uh, there is a problem, which is, which is that the other, other countries were asking to redeem the dollars that they held in their vaults into gold. We did not have enough gold at that point. So in an act, we did not know what was going to happen it was an act of desperation, um, but actually nobody really cared too much. Everybody was like, wow, okay, now the dollar is free. And I think there is a very strong sense among Wall Street and big business in America that a lot of money was about to be made, which is exactly what happened. I got it. So we have another question from Leah. Oh, this is like... Love it. This is this is a, a lovely little play for our neighbors to the north as well. What is stopping America from getting rid of the penny? <laughs> um, that's a great question because you know the penny is so funny. Uh, the, the penny is such bad math. Like like what is it like the pre nineteen eighty four pennies, which are made of copper. You know a hundred of them are kind of worth a, worth like a buck a buck forty. Whereas now these pennies that are made of zinc, uh, you know, a hundred of them are actually worth like 89 cents. So this, it's so clear that money is a fiction that we, that it has nothing to do with anything that the under, anything it's attached to as a quote unquote underlying value. I, I think the pennies days are numbered. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of, um, what was it in, in, you know, the late nineties, early two thousands when they tried to bring back the, um, the dollar coin, the Sacagawea dollar. And then that just led to all sorts of problems that we hadn't thought about, that, that vending machines, the slots in them couldn't take a dollar coin, but we had the ability for vending machines to take paper dollar bills or higher and have, the, have it changed out. And, and it just kind of, now it seems like an oddity when you someone gives you one or you see one in circulation, it's like, oh, Wow, that you know, I haven't seen a dollar coin in so long. Yes, but what what does the Susan B. Anthony dollar coin and the Sacagawea dollar coin have in common? Hmm, we're not ready. You know, money has long been personified from the earliest gong money of Vietnam that had a voice to Indonesian money that could dance to money with faces on it, right? Money has always been the personification of human desire. That's what money is. Uh, the, the epigraph to the book is from Billie Eilish. I had a dream, I got everything I wanted. That's money, the personification of desire. And money has long been personified. We live clearly in a sexist culture. We are not ready for female money. We are not ready for a black woman to be on the $20 bill. Can't, can't compute, no, 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 we like, uh, 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 can't compute anymore, right? Um, and so therefore it doesn't circulate. Instead of circulation, it becomes part of a hoard, a collectible. Something that's collectible is not money, very different things. Actually, and that's a very excellent segue into this next question uh, from Dennis. 
there are hobbyists who collect rare coins and paper money. Do you see a hobby continuing into the future as we use more and more digital currency, debit, credit cards, et cetera? That's a great question. You know, there, there are more than 2,000 uh, cryptos out there now. And uh, a lot of people are very interested in having a variety of them. And, and I do think that they are collectible in that way. Um, there, are some, there are some odd ones. There is, of course, Trump coin, which <laughs> came out not too long after the election. There is a, a, something called a Jesus coin that came out as a hoax, as a farce, but immediately people collected it. They liked it and it, all of a sudden it became, quote unquote, monetized. So absolutely, we're gonna, we, we see the exact same thing going on with Bitcoin as we do with a dollar, because as I used to say, you know, people would say when I was writing this book, oh, you're going to talk about, going to talk about cryptocurrency. And I was like, hey, you know, the dollar is a Bitcoin. The dollar is a cryptocurrency. And we're just going to see more and more of this, of course, as Facebook comes out with money, as the Federal Reserve comes out with the quote unquote digital dollar. Uh, you know, we already, you know, airline miles. No, nobody, nobody even thinks twice about using that for money or Amex, Amex points. Right. We don't really care in this country if there's an underlying value. Um, that's America. You know, the, as I said before, the, the people who came here first, they forgot to bring enough money. <laughs> Excellent. And I, I did enjoy um, how you put the book together, too, with, with these quotes. And you mentioned in the epigraph, Billie Eilish. And, and I really liked how her quote was put up against Wallace Stevens, who was an insurance agent and a poet. And, and I find those things very interesting. It's like you wouldn't expect necessarily like a Harvard educated business person who was an insurance agent to write lyric poetry, but they do. And the, the other thing I found fascinating was that the more I pushed money fiction, I found again and again that many of these figures in the history of money were also literary figures, that they were writers, that they were, that they were poets, and that somehow the literary imagination is inextricably connected to the monetary imagination. And that really, I had the very strong sense when you start looking at primitive money, that these people who were making these beads and shells into money, that they were poets, that they were imbuing these physical objects and creating emblems out of them, either through spells or incantations. And, and, and also, m much like we ask economists to do now, they were soothsayers. They were predicting the future. And of course, in order to do that, a lot of the times they were throwing the dice, throwing the shells. They were gamblers, right? And of course, you know, these, all of these things are very closely connected. The lyric imagination the gambling imagination. I spend a lot of time with Casanova, who was, of course, a great writer and a great gambler. Uh, and his ideas about money are, are very are very interesting in terms of the oddly enough in terms of the developing the development of modern quantitative finance. Fascinating. Well, if anyone has any last minute questions, feel free to go ahead and type those in um, so we can get them answered. You know, just a reminder um, to go ahead and call your local bookstores and order a copy of The Money Plot. It's a fascinating, it's a fast read, um, perfect for the holiday season. And in, you, you can just go through and find all of these great literary quotes and just and be fascinated like I was. Um, you know, all of our local independent bookstores here in Atlanta and across Georgia throughout the country have done so much during this pandemic with books by mail and home delivery and contactless pickup. Even here in Decatur, they're doing pop-up stores on the square and things like that um, for the holiday season and so you all can shop and browse books since we can't go into bookstores and we can't go into libraries. So wherever you are, we encourage you to go ahead and, and find your local independent bookstore and support them um, because they have been supporting the literary community during this whole pandemic. Um, so give a little back. There's my pitch. Um, well, if no one has any other questions, Frederick, thank you so much for talking to us tonight. It's such a fascinating subject. Um, I am sure that in the 
coming months, oh, wait, something just blinked. We are going to have a lot more questions about finances. Um, oh, actually, and this is a, a, a good follow-up from Ellen. And she asks, how can you say that we are not ready to accept a woman on coins or currency when in the UK and Canada and Australia, Queen Elizabeth II is on their currency? Yep, the coinage of the Commonwealth, of course, HMQ, her image gets updated every 10 years or so as well. When I, when I said we, I meant this country. <laughs> but, but, you, you know, and, and unfortunately, unfortunately, absolute, absolutely, uh, you know, Juno Moneta, uh, it, her image, the goddess of money, is is all over ancient Roman coinage. I, I think that, you know, obviously this country is a real problem with sexism. And, and I think that's a real, that is a real issue. Along those lines, though, what I found fascinating was the idea that in 19th century England, when Queen Victoria died, many merchants would no longer accept coins with her image on them because it was dead money. That is how closely people associate people with their money. And I, and I think that once again, goes to the heart of our problem in this country. I see, you know, and that, that reminds me too of, um, you know, I, mean, has, I think everybody's watched The Crown and everybody's seen the episode where they update the Queen's portrait on the stamps. But you know, in France, um, Marianne, who's on all of the stamps is like the symbol of liberty. They actually pick a model and, and um, Catherine Deneuve, was actually the model for Marianne in France for the longest time because she was like the epitome of French beauty. And, and you know, no one had a problem with an actress representing, you know, uh, fraternity and liberté for a period of 20 some odd years. Um, you know, I don't think we could probably get away with that in the United States. And of course, yet yeah, the Liberty dollar and the half dollar have female images, walking liberty, standing liberty. I, I remember that from um, collecting coins back in the day. Thing too, the, the whole notion of the allegorical money, right? Allegorical mm -hmm. money, and money is traditionally female, right? The I, the I, like if you look if you if you look back to the Romans, and then into the 19th century, lady credit, right? Mm -hmm. In this country, all of a sudden, around the once again post Bretton Woods 1980s, money veers male. In, in this note, and, and this is widely, uh, you know, the scholars are all over this in terms of, you know, Wall Street, greed is good, Michael Milken and Ivan Bosky, uh, money gets, gets, turns male in this country in the 1980s, the, uh, you know, the, the junk bond king, exactly. And, and so, and it becomes tyrannical. It, it's almost like it's, it's power, has, be, has been unleashed and it is a violent power at that point. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a, there's, there's a lot we have to do to remedy that. Yeah, that's, a, yeah, um, you know, even, you know, carry that forward, you know, the, the, the defiant girl statue in front of the bull at Wall Street caused such a huge stir. Um, and it's no, and it's no, and, and it's for good reason that it's a girl. Exactly, that the, that the bull, of course, is, as we, as we saw earlier, is this ancient symbol of money. The, the livestock actually is money. The bull is money. And of course, that is, you know, if you, if you look at the statue down in Wall Street, which is not too far from where I live, what is the part that people touch the most? Are the male bull's balls, the testicles. Everybody wants to touch it, to feel that. It is this male embodiment of money being faced off with the girl, with the female. Uh, this, I think, to, to a great extent is the future of money. I think that money is going in a different direction and I think we're going to see more artisanal currency. And I think we are, we were talking about barter as being, uh, as never having existed. But what we see with barter is a different idea of socialization and money. And we find barter in, in post currency environments. We find barter for instance, uh, in wartime environments, when the money is worthless, we find it in prison economies with like weapons and candy. And what we're also seeing is people become increasingly disenchanted, I think, with a lot of what's going on with our money system is we're seeing more localized currencies, artisanal currencies and barter economies, right? And I think that is not the past, but I think if anything, that is the, a future hope 
of civilized money where it will come back to what it should, what originally it should be, which is insurance and community and security. Excellent. Well, I think that's a great point to end on. I, we've had a lovely, lively discussion um, and I thank you so much for it. Once again, thank you all for allowing us to come into your homes tonight and talk to you, share a little bit of knowledge, have a little bit of fun. Uh, and we hope to see you again very, very soon. Frederick, thank you so very much and much success with the money plot. Thank Have you. a wonderful evening and we'll see you all again very, very soon.